Hey everybody, welcome back to the program. I am very excited because I have a very special guest here in the vinyl pad, music maker Equip. Thank you so much for being on the program. Thank you for having me. This is exciting. So we have your brand new record here, Curse Breaker X. I've listened to it and it's, it's, I love it. No joke, when I first put the needle on the record and those first beats came in, I was like, oh, this is, this is what I live for. It just, it was nostalgic, but also it was new. It was like a sensory experience. My ears perked up. There was something about it. It had tinges of of the score to Goonies, and so I have that nice that <laughs> that feeling. And it and also it's the start of an adventure. Goonies is an adventure. Yeah, this is a, an incredible concept. Like a well, you you can probably put it in better words than, than I can, but but this is an adventure, a, a G, JRPG soundtrack to a game that has yet to be made. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yeah, I'm I'm glad that you got the adventure aspect out of it because I've I've always wanted to convey a, a journey in my music, and I feel like this is the closest I've gotten to making a really concise, compact journey that you can go on, like on your commute to work or you know on your way to the grocery store. I mean, based on your previous two albums, I'm assuming that this started off with the concept in mind. Yes and no. Okay. Um, usually when I'm done with an album, I'm kind of just done writing music for a while and yeah, I'll relax I yeah. and I have to kind of recharge the, the creative canon. Yeah. Yeah, I took an extra long break after my last record, Synthetic Core, and I didn't really know what I wanted to do. And I ended up coming out here um, to the West Coast and I played a couple shows with uh, George and Lindsay. And I've seen their live shows before, but every time I, I see them, they get better and better and better. And I was especially just paying attention to the dynamics of George's new music from Slide and seeing yeah. how the crowd has reacted. And I wanted that reaction so bad yeah. in my crowd. So I, I came back home just like really creatively inspired and I started working on music right away. I wasn't sure what I was gonna do with it, but I started incorporating more active elements, more break beats, more like sampled pre-recorded drum loops. I never really messed with that before. I'd always mm. liked to program all of my own drums one by yeah. one. Uh, basically with the goal of making the live show more lit. Oh. Um, I, I see people react very viscerally when a break beat hits and I definitely was trying to channel more uh, live energy into the studio compositions. I didn't really start working on the story until I was about three or four tunes in. Oh, wow. And then at that point, I'll start kind of sequencing out where I want those tunes in the album to be and what needs to fill the gaps to happen in between. Um, for this one in particular, I used uh, The Hero's Journey, which yeah. is sort of a, a general diagram of just about every story that's ever been told. It's, you know, it starts off with Hero has an, an issue or quest, you know, there's the call to action. Yeah. Uh, they reach the threshold guardian, which they decide whether or not they want to follow through. They follow through. There's usually like a building up and a tearing down of the character, yeah. a final battle, a redemption, and then like a purification, and then it kind of goes back to the beginning. Yeah. So I basically took the hero's diagram and I started kind of mapping out which track was which part of the diagram. I don't want to uh, downplay your previous efforts, but this record is the most nuanced I found in your work. Like, Thank you. Like it really shows what you took in, like you were saying from George and Negative Gemini, their performances and, and, and like changing how, maybe a little bit how you approach your music. And it really shows in here because it's, there, there's a lot of detail going on. Thank and it's you. not it's not just like pure, nostalgia driven 
video game effects laid over you know what i mean like it's 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 taking all of what you've done before and then really honing it down and like you said you know making it a real compact album and i just i loved hearing the progression of your work because i'm really glad that you got that out of it because this is definitely um the record that i'm the most proud of making and i spent a lot of dedicated time where you know i had my phone off and all distractions out of the way and yeah you know a lot of time to just work on nothing but the music and there's an old um old quote i think uh it's a henry rollins quote which is uh yeah. lock yourself in your room and don't come out until you've made something awesome like i would force myself yeah. to, to solve problems and try to make it as clear and concise as possible and after i finished the tracks too i would go through them and listen to them and try to find parts that didn't sound necessary and i just straight cut them out and try to try to squeeze as much action into as small of a space as possible. So I'm glad that you got that out of it. That's, uh, it's definitely my most detailed and concise effort to date. Do you have a favorite track? Yeah. Um, the last track that I made for the record is uh, Lightbringer Obtained, and that one's probably my favorite. In the general scheme of the narrative for Curse Breaker X, this is when uh, Equip makes his way to the pure sword and reunites it with the cursed sword. And it's supposed to be this kind of powerful explosion yeah. of energy. And um, the, the mastering process that I use, I run everything through cassette tape and then I kind of resample it back to the computer to oh. give it a like oh, a sampled, yeah. like a vaporwave sampled vibe. And the way that the, the last chorus uh, hit the tape, it kind of like distorts it in this really pleasing way and kind of compresses it. But it, it definitely, uh, when I heard it, I was like, ah, that's the perfect embodiment of like the sound, the visuals that I'm picturing when I'm making the record. <laughs> love that you, there you, you have that element of randomness that yeah. you introduce with analog yeah it takes a couple tries sometimes i'll run it through tape yeah. three or four times before i find like the perfect take and sometimes you get um, especially if you've recorded over the same tape you get dropouts where like it'll kind of fizz out for a second and then come back and i love when that happens during like a snare crack it just makes it sound like the snare is like punching through the speakers or yeah. something and it's like broken something. That kind of sound is is prevalent in Vaporwave in general and I think people really like audio imperfections and even like the sound of over compressed fried MP3s mm -hmm. is something that was, as I learned in audio <laughs> school, it's, it's the most undesirable effect possible when you're recording music. But that's like what the... Uh, what the old fogies want you to believe. And really it's people like the sound of fried, compressed, lo-fi yeah. stuff. I mean, a lot of people, not everybody, but yeah, I think that imperfections in music and dirty scars in music are infinitely more interesting than like glossy high def sounds. <laughs> Going back to um, when you do kind of the mastering in a yeah. way process, you bounce to tape. Mm -hmm. Is that just cassette tape or is that like a like quarter inch or something? It's cassette tape, but I've been trying to get my hands on a quarter inch machine. I okay. want to experiment with different textures of tape and different kinds of tape just to see what it does to the audio. Yeah. My secret process I will reveal right now. Oh boy. Uh, <laughs> I actually speed up the masters digitally before I burn them to tape. So... Well, why? why? Um, because Vaporwave is slowed down music, essentially. Right. You know, right. and I've already made the song at the speed that I want it. So yeah. in order to give it a slowed down feel, I have to speed it up. So I usually bump up the BPM by, okay. you know, maybe 20 or 30. Sometimes I'll do really extreme cases if it's like simplistic tones. The more elements at work, the more detail you lose with this process. Uh -huh. So I'll make it faster so, you know, the drums are are really fast and it sounds high-pitched. Yeah, I'll, I was going to say, it raises the pitch, not it just... It raises the okay. pitch. Okay. So I'll burn that to tape. 
a little bit hot. Like I'll make it hit the meters at mm -hmm. like plus three to plus five decibels. Pushing the limits. Yeah. <laughs> and what happens is you get really weird high frequency artifacts because the high frequencies get even higher and then it hits the tape and then the imperfections in the tape usually start at the high frequencies. You get a little bit of warble. Yeah. So you can accentuate that if you put more high frequencies into it and you hit it at a hotter level. So then when I put it back to the computer, I record it as is, but then I digitally stretch it back out and pitch it down to the original tempo. Or sometimes I'll slow it down a little bit past the original tempo by like two or three BPM. Yeah, every track has been sped up digitally, recorded to tape, hot, bounced back to digital, stretched back out. And they get ran through a mastering chain twice. So they're actually double mastered, which is a big no-no for, right. for audio engineers. But um, it's inspired by a public enemy interview I read years ago where oh, yeah. uh, somebody was asking about the production on public enemy records and why how did they get it to like bang so hard and their answer was well it's we're sampling already mastered material and then we add the vocals to it and then we give it to our mastering engineer and they master it so they're mastering already boosted compressed mastered audio and it just it makes it punch even more <laughs> The whole Spotify algorithm thing, you know, like if if your song isn't immediately grabbing within the first couple seconds, it's gonna get skipped. So I tried to like also in this record like make oh. the intro kind of like a little portrait of what the song's gonna be by like having one of the main riffs in the beginning or just some sort of like ear catching thing that would make you not want to skip it if you were yeah. just algorithmed some songs. A lot of people are like upset that streaming is changing the way that music is being written, sure. but I don't know. I think it's more exciting now than it's ever been. So I think that, that has something to do with it. Like people are making more explosive, exciting, shorter songs uh, and they're releasing them one by one as singles, yeah, you know, which yeah. is something that we did with this record too. I've never like done pre-release singles before. I love the way that it worked out and it seems like there's a great reception to the singles and I'm probably just going to do singles, you know, from now on. I, yeah. George was even talking about releasing an album single by single until every single song on the album has been released, and then you just make the compilation album. I'm a huge pop music fan. I love, you know, yeah. Dorian Electra, Kim Petras, Charlie XCX, Slater all these artists are like infinitely inspiring and yeah uh I, I think it's pop now is doing really fun and interesting things and that new charlie xcx record is like there's a ton of really cool production on it uh i'm really interested in that those kind of sounds i think that's that might be where i take the equip project next cool. is is kind of take what i've established but try to make it a little glossier while still keeping the lo-fi elements in yeah. tow Before I forget, I actually, I brought you some presents. What? Um, we just made these for 100% um, Electronic. Oh, that's right. We have to talk yesterday. about that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, which was amazing. But here is um, Curse Breaker X on cassette. Amazing. Look at that. The uh, cool thing about that is it's the same album on both sides. So. Oh. Oh, you yeah? can just continually flip it. You know, there's never going to be any, like, I got to fast forward and hear the A side again. Oh, that's awesome. I love that. It's got the beautiful Keith Rankin uh, illustration on the <laughs> inside. And uh, this one's kind of interesting. This is um, Curse Breaker Gaiden, which is, uh, when I was making this record, I wanted to make an original Vaporwave accompaniment album. All right. Similar to more. what George did with 
the 100% Electronica album. He oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. made an Esprit album called 200% Electronica, where he used samples from himself, from his 100% record, and kind of restructured them to this new... That's cool, yeah, yeah, yeah. ...kind of trippy, new age thing. So, yeah, these, um, these are the Echo Jams that I made from Curse Breaker. I say Echo Jams like everybody knows what I'm talking about. Um, That's a beautiful cassette there. Thank you. So those, I basically, they're like chop and screw remixes from uh, Curse Breaker X. Uh, and these we put as the B-sides to the singles that we released. Yeah, uh, that's the, the album came out. That's yeah, the so there's the full triptych made by uh, one of my favorite artists ever, uh, Bonnie Chan. It's beautiful. I love that. It's very... Uh, She's incredible. Final Fantasy Seven. Sorry, the Japanese releases of Final Fantasy. Yeah. Like Final Fantasy three here, but six. Right. Yeah. I'm glad you picked up on that vibe because yeah. I've always liked the contrast between Japanese box art versus American box yeah. art. Right. And yeah, I, I maybe somebody else caught on it too, but I, I tried to make the pre-release singles like the Japanese style artwork using Bonnie's illustrations. And then I gave those to Keith and I was like, I want like oh, the American, yes. like okay. high fantasy Dungeons and Dragons That's... versions of this. There's a, a series called Fantasy Star and the Japanese mm -hmm. box art, they're made by this artist, uh, Hitoshi Oneda. And they're really, really gorgeous and intricate. And then you get the American versions and it's like, it looks like a pulp sci-fi, like late seventies novel. <laughs> it's kind of a ridiculous contrast. It, it makes you wonder why they had to change the art. But yeah. that, that Japanese versus American box art thing is so endearing to me. And I kind of went for that vibe with the, the Curse Breaker and the Curse Breaker Gaiden. Cassette. So, this is actually the original Equip avatar that I had commissioned from Bonnie in the first place. I basically told her what I wanted. Yeah. Um, sent her a, a couple photos of myself and was like, if you can make this kind of resemble me, but yeah, a little more ambiguous, you know, gender wise and appearance wise. Uh, and yeah, I think she totally knocked it out of the park with that. So, this illustration was then provided to Keith, who made the final cover. Because he also did the back. Yep. Yeah, so do uh, you have anything coming up? Any, any future releases we should look forward to? Yeah, uh, a couple cool things coming up. Uh, we did the tapes that I just gave yes. you. Yes, um, those are great. I can't wait to pop them in my cassette player. Yeah, so we, we only made 100 of each for Electronicon, but uh, fret not, we will make a widespread pressing. We're thinking about doing kind of a cool deluxe version in like a, like a Sega Genesis style clamshell. Um, I made like inserts for them. I just need to source the clamshells and we've got like a poster that'll fold up where the instruction yeah. manual usually goes. And yeah. the Yeti is doing a CD version of Synthetic Core 88. Uh, Drew Wise, the artist that did the art for that has made this beautiful package that looks like a, a Japanese Sega Saturn game. Um, the disc is black, like a PlayStation game. That's great. Uh, we ordered a Curse Breaker repress, so that'll... Fantastic. Yeah, and... Uh, Yeti Records has actually wholesaled a special pressing that'll be like a Yeti exclusive variant. Oh, um, that's great. It'll be like yellow, like kind of mustard yellow with like a burst of like red and blue coming out of it. Kind of like matching yeah. the color. See how there's like a little bit of yellow yes. behind Equip there. I think it's going to look super cool. I've seen other records that have the same yellow color and I think like a a burst effect will look, it'll be similar to this, but yeah. a little bit louder. <laughs> and uh, Yeti Records always likes to put like a cool like art print in with it. So we're gonna do commission a special print for it. And I might, uh, Yeti's in Aurora, so I might drive up there and like sign all the prints to oh, make it like great. as special as I can for their special pressing. And Mark and I um, have made a complete album as Equip in R23X. I heard about this. Uh, it's called Nameless Dreamers. That's our project. We'll definitely bill it as Equip in R23X, but it's like a new venture for both of us. It's kind of... It's like the postal service. Yeah. A vaporwave. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, I think it might be too wacky and experimental for George to do on 100%. You know, of course we'll offer it yeah. to him, but I don't know if he's going to want to put out this weird symphonic, like, <laughs> lo-fi hip-hop record. It's... Oh, I like that already. Mark, uh, R23X uses a bunch of kind of lo-fi, like organic beats. Yeah. Um, and he also, uh, under his own name, does like film score stuff. So he's got, he's really like symphonically minded 
And I, I've done kind of like fake symphonic stuff with uh, synthetic core. So it's kind of like a cool merging of like real orchestral sounds with like fake Super Nintendo orchestral sounds. And it's really unique and it's really cool. And it's very like us. Like Cool. It sounds like equipment or 23X hanging out. Oh, man. And Can't wait for that. So that's exciting. How do we or how do we stay in the loop with all that you're doing? What's the best way to do that? I'm super active on uh, Twitter. Um, my Twitter handle is equipped with you and uh, Instagram as well. I post on Instagram uh, every other day or so. And uh, and I also have a uh, website worldofequip.com. Well, thank you so very much for coming down to the vinyl pad. I really appreciate Thanks so it. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, because I know you're a busy guy. you got a lot to do, but uh, thank you so much. It's been a yeah. pleasure. It's been a pleasure as well. Thank you so much. Yeah. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for watching. I'm your Vinyl Geek, and I'll catch you on the flip side.